Tonight we'll be in 1 Samuel chapter 18. Now in this chapter, it begins to detail the rise of David. And we see his rise is in the love and esteem of the people. And as a result of that, Saul's jealousy and hatred for David becomes more and more pronounced. And, and it's clear he, he begins to despise David. And he wants David dead. And this chapter, it begins with the making of a covenant between Jonathan and David. And this covenant, it speaks of the covenant of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, which he made with the Father for his people. And, and we see it from our perspective in what the Lord does for his people in fulfilling that covenant and establishing that covenant of grace for his people. And then we're taken through a number of examples a series of examples of where Saul's jealousy began and, and how he sought to kill David in a number of ways, a number of times. It just takes us through a whole series of, of examples of him trying to kill David. And had Saul succeeded in killing David, this covenant would have never been fulfilled. David would never have fulfilled his covenant promise to Jonathan that he made with Jonathan had Saul succeeded. But instead, Saul failed in every attempt that he tried to destroy David. He failed in it, and David just kept rising in the esteem and the love of the people, God blessing David each time. And as he went through this, as this persecution continued after the covenant was established, after that persecution continued, it became more and more clear that David is the anointed of God to be the king. He is the anointed of God to be the king. So let's pick up in the first two verses, Psalm, uh, 1 Samuel 18, verse 1 and 2. And it came to pass, when David had made an end of speaking unto Saul, this is right after Goliath has been killed. He speaks to Saul. Well, right after that, that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took David that day and would not and would let him go no more to home to his father's house. Now, at this point, everything seems to be, go, everything seems to be going wonderfully. Everything's good. Every, everyone's happy. There's no issues. Jonathan loved David. Saul received David and was happy to have him in his service, of his administration there. Then, it says then, and that's when something began to change. Then, verse 3, then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. Now, this covenant was not known to Saul. Saul didn't know about this covenant, and to be frank with you, it's not even known to us the details of this covenant, what this covenant means or what it's about. We'll learn that a little later as we go through the other chapters. We'll begin to understand what this covenant is. And for now, though we're told a few things that are worthy of our notice in verse 4. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him and gave it to David and his garments, even to his sword and to his bow and to his girdle. So these things which were done here are given to foretell. They're to, to speak to us of the covenant of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I mean, he's taken us into covenant with him, but it, it doesn't depend on us at all. It all depends on the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is speaking of the covenant between Christ, the Son of God, and the Father. And so there's just a few things. Let me sh share three things about this covenant 
begin here. For one, it says, Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him. And we know what happened in Adam, how that Adam, when he sinned and rebelled against God, he was found to be naked. And we in our sin are found to be naked and stripped and have nothing to, to glory in or, or boast in. We have nothing to clothe ourselves. And so there's nothing to, to boast in or glory in of what we've done. But this looks further past into eternity. This looks deeper into eternity than that stripping. For Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him and gave it to David. And what this speaks of here is what the father did in putting all the care, all the needs, everything that concerns us and our salvation and our deliverance for the fall. <laughs> everything that we needed, our father, before any of that happened, put all the care and trust in his son. And David's the, David pictures Christ here. And I'm not saying Jonathan pictures the Lord, but what I am saying is that our Father gave everything into the hand of Christ for the salvation, for the keeping, for the safekeeping of his people. And so because the Father did that, we did that. <laughs> we did that in, in, in him by his grace and mercy. And so this is a picture of of what the Father has done for us in grace, just like he opens our ear. He makes us to hear. He makes us to come to the Father in, in mercy, seeking mercy as make mercy beggars. He does that for us in grace. Well, the Father did this. And in that, in his grace, we did this in Christ, submitting everything to Christ's care so that our robe, a picture of our righteousness, it's laid at the feet of of Christ because whose whose righteousness do we need Christ's righteousness because in the fall we don't have a righteousness we have a righteousness full of holes full of blemishes full of spots full of stench we don't have a righteousness to stand before holy God our garments are submitted to Christ meaning we are committing and entrusting all things to the Lord Jesus Christ to save us he's our inheritance we're going to obtain that inheritance because of the Lord Jesus Christ, not because of what we do, but because of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we shall be raised a new body, an heavenly body, because of the life of Christ, a body fashioned after Christ's body because he's the maker of it, and he shall return and raise us again in him, in his life. Then it says even to his sword, and to his bow that was removed from us, meaning all our warfare, offensive and defensive weapons, it, we are completely dependent upon Christ to fight for us and to save us from our enemy. It's all in his hands. And to his girdle, so that Christ is the one who keeps us in truth. And as we saw in the armor, that girdle is around this area, our, our, where we put our belt around the area where we bear fruit. And it's a picture of our fruit bearing is in truth in the Lord Jesus Christ. Otherwise, we don't bear any fruit unto God. It's dead fruit. It's dead fruit, Romans 7, 4 and 5. And so he keeps us. And so this is a picture of the Father putting all things into his hands and by his grace and power, it, it represents us putting all things into Christ's hands. It's a it's the Lord doing that in eternity for his people. And then third, our Lord Jesus Christ was robed in the likeness of our flesh. And he came and accomplished our redemption. He redeemed his people from their sins and reconciles us to the Father. Paul says it this way in 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, Yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. And so when it comes to the covenant of grace, this is 
our Lord is now showing us that, that there is a covenant people, and because they are in the covenant, there will be persecution, and there will be suffering. Right? Our, what did Paul say? He said, all that will live godly in this present life will suffer persecution. You will, and, and that's true. If you, for, for Christ's sake, do something in the world, the world's going to find some fault with it, and they're going to persecute you for it. And it may be something great or something small, but, but if, for, if it's for Christ's sake, someone's going to find fault with it and be offended. Now, we're told in verse 5, And David went out whithersoever Saul sent him and behaved, and behaved himself wisely. And Saul set him over the men of war, and he was accepted in the sight of all the people, and also in the sight of Saul's servants. And so for a brief time, things seemed fine, but this covenant had been made. And the reality is, we saw where Samuel had been sent, and he anointed David, the king of Israel, of God's own choosing. He was anointed, and so the fruits of David's coming were going to become a stench in Saul's nostrils. He was going to, to the enmity in Saul was going to be provoked, and it's going to come out against David in an attempt to destroy David. And this is where we begin to see in David further likenesses of our Lord, pictures of Christ and his coming. As he went in, in Israel and did the works that the Father sent him to do, the Pharisees, the self-righteous, Sadducees and Herodians and lawyers and scribes and doctors and religious men the, the leaders, they hated Christ more and more. All right, when he came, he said, The works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do, bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me. But we know that the Jews did not believe Christ, and they rejected him, and they persecuted him more and more, and, and then they crucified him. And so it was that Saul, he took notice of David. He began to notice that the people were going after David, much the way that the religious leaders noticed that the people were being drawn to Christ, were being touched and amazed by his words and his works, and they began to get jealous because of, of what Christ did when he came and began to minister the gospel and to do those works the Father sent him to do. And so look at verses 6 through 9. <clears throat> and it came to pass, as they came, when David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, that the women came out of all cities of Israel, singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tabrets, with joy, and with instruments of music. And the women answered one another as they played and said, Saul hath slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. And Saul was very wroth, and, saying, and the saying displeased him. And he said, They have ascribed unto David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed but thousands. And what can he have more but the kingdom? Yes, that is true, <laughs> because he is the anointed of God, and the fruits of God, of his blessing, was upon David, and beginning to, to come out be expressed in that way. And Saul eyed David from that day forward. And, and why, so, why is Saul so upset? Well, if David is king, Saul must die. It's just, there's just not two kings in the kingdom. <laughs> if David is king, then Saul must die. And this you know, really gets to, to, to us in Christ. And, and that uh, the work of his grace for us because each of us in our own minds we're kings of our own bodies of our own minds of our own thoughts at least we we fancy ourselves to be that we like to think that that we are rulers over our own selves even though we're all in bondage to sin by nature but one of the telling marks of a believer who's redeemed by the blood of Christ is that we die to self and Christ is king 
He's the Lord of our, of, of our hearts. He's our, our God, our Lord, our Christ, our Savior, our all. And, and you know, John Baptist said it best. I must decrease, he must increase. And the believer is made happy in that. And we, we do. Paul even uses that language. We die to self. And we live to Christ. This old man is mortified, put to death by the grace and power of God. And, and yet the new man in us, born of Christ, is that, that increases more and more in looking to Christ and, and trusting Christ. And we see him more and more. But this old man of flesh doesn't like that. Right? The old man of flesh wars against the truth. And the, this old man of flesh wants the praise and the glory. But the reality is, Saul was not the one who defeated the mighty Goliath. It was David. David defeated him. And yet Saul wanted the glory for being the king. And he didn't like that David was getting that, that honor. And so it is with this old man. This old man is jealous. And it wars against the truth of God. And it sets up imaginations against the truth of Christ. But the gospel of our Lord is what tears it down and brings us low in ourselves. And by his grace, he brings things that humble us and bring us low in ourselves to see our all in Christ, to know that Christ is all. Next, we're told in verse 10, And it came to pass on the morrow that the evil spirit from God came upon Saul, and he prophesied in the midst of the house, and David played with his hand, as at other times. And there was a javelin in Saul's hand. And Saul cast the javelin, for he said, I will smite David even to the wall with it. And David avoided out of his presence twice. Not once, but twice. And Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him and was departed from Saul. So you're going to see this repeated. Saul was afraid of David. Saul feared. Saul was was envy David. You're going to see this throughout this chapter. It's repeated constantly. And so Saul's hatred of David was increasing. And anything David did, Saul hated it more and more. And what was David doing? He was making beautiful music. <laughs> beautiful music. Right? What was Christ doing when the Pharisees hated him? He was preaching the glories of God. Declaring the gospel of God. Preaching the sweet, glorious gracious good news of the father and yet men of this world men of the flesh men of religion self-righteousness hated that good news hated hated christ for preaching the free sovereign grace of god to save whom he will and they hated that and what did they do they wanted to just like saul wanted to kill david twice it says there same thing with the, the Pharisees. More than once, they tried to kill him. More than once, the flesh of man tried to kill Christ. Not once, not twice, more than that. Right In Luke 4, when Christ was baptized and came up from the wilderness of temptation by the devil there, he began his ministry and he went into the synagogues preaching in Galilee and it says he went into Nazareth, where he was from, and he read Isaiah and, and told them grace words. He told them today these words are fulfilled in your hearing. The people wondered at the grace words which came out of his mouth. And he told them, he, he declared the gospel, how that God is sovereign to save whom he will. And to prove that, he in the scriptures, he walked past all these widows in Israel and went and saved a Gentile widow. And he went past all these these lepers in Israel, and he went and saved, he cleansed the leprosy of a Gentile. And they hated Christ for saying that. They hated Christ for, for declaring the sovereign grace of God to save whom he will. Because man wants the glory. Man wants to boast in what he's done. And so they, they, it says, the scriptures, Luke 4 says, they were filled with wrath. They drove him out of the synagogue, out of their city, up the hill, and wanted to cast him down headlong, but he, walking right through the midst of them, went his way, and they couldn't do it. 
And then in John 5, also early on in the ministry, we're told that the Jews sought the more to kill him because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but made, but made God his father, or said God was his father, thereby making himself to be God. And they wanted to kill him for that. Right? And then John 7, 1 says he stopped walking around in Jewry because the Jews sought to kill him. And so he stayed up in Galilee most of that time. Right? They were always, they wanted to kill him. They wanted to put him to death. And then eventually, we know they did. When the time came, when it was time for his sacrifice for the people, he willingly went to the cross. And they, they murdered him. They took him and killed him. But it was all according to the grace, to the, according to the, the will and purpose, the determined purpose of God to save his people. It was all for the salvation of his people. Then we see another case here in verse 13 where Saul tries to get crafty to ensnare David another way. He wanted to kill him, and so he tries to get crafty. Verse 13, therefore Saul removed David from him. In other words, he put him out into another company and made him his captain over a thousand. That's pretty high. Right? We know in the beginning there that Jonathan had a thousand men under his command and Saul had two thousand. Well, David now has a thousand men under his command and he went out and came in before the people. And David behaved himself wisely in all his ways and the Lord was with him. Wherefore, when Saul saw that he behaved himself very wisely, here it is again, he was afraid of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David because he went out and came in before them. And so Saul here, he thought, I'll ruin David before the people. I'll send him out there and he'll start making mistakes. He'll say the wrong thing. He'll do the wrong thing. He'll, 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 he'll mess up somehow. He'll stumble and he'll fall. And then the people won't love him anymore. And that's how I'll ruin David. Well, that's what they tried to do with Christ. right? They tried to do that with, with our Lord. They tried to entangle him in his words before the people so that the people would know this isn't the Christ. Right? They did the same thing. We're told of, of it's mostly in Matthew 22 has it all. But first it was the Pharisees and the Herodians. And they got together and they tried to, to entangle Christ by asking him whether it was right to pay tribute to Caesar. And we know the wisdom of our Lord in saying, whose, whose uh, image and superscription is this? Caesar's. And he said, well, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. And they were astonished at that. Actually, it says that they marveled at his response because he answered wisely. He didn't make a mistake. And then the Sadducees came right after that with their best question that would stumble and, 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 and mess up the Pharisees. They came with, with the question about marriage in, in an effort to disprove the resurrection. But Christ's answer left the crowd astonished at his doctrine. And then a lawyer of the Pharisees came and asked him about the great commandment in the law. And Christ not only answered that question, satisfactorily to them but he asked a question which they were unable to answer about david saying my lord the, the lord said unto my lord sit thou at my right hand and that's david's son well how can that be that he calls him lord and they couldn't answer that question and what happened as a result they didn't dare ask him any other questions from that day forward that was it it was done they were done asking questions so the same thing here David behaved himself wisely. Christ behaved himself wisely. As they tried to let him, you know, give him enough rope to hang himself, it didn't happen because God was with him, because he is the anointed of the Lord. And then this brings us to what I think is meant to be a beautiful gospel picture, which involves Saul's two daughters, Mirab and Michal, I think it's pronounced, but... I'll say Michal, I don't know, Michael or something, but it's, it's, but Mirab and, and Michal. So Saul <clears throat> had promised his daughter's hand in marriage to the man that slew Goliath. And that should have been Mirab, because Mirab 
was the firstborn, and she wasn't yet married at that time. It should have been Merab. But Saul said to David, you know, Saul wants to make you a son-in-law of Saul, and, and, but, but he said, I need you to continue fighting the Philistines and being brave and, and, and going after my enemies. But Saul, uh, well, David answered very humbly. He said, well, I'm really not worthy to be the king's son-in-law. And we really don't read of anything occurring, no battles, nothing happening that David did at that time for Saul. And so when it came time for Saul to give his daughter Merab's hand in marriage, Saul gave her to another man. It says that he gave him to Adriel, the Maholathite. And, and so, so David didn't get his wife. But then immediately he was told that his younger daughter, Michal or Michael, that she loved David. She loved David. And Saul thought, this is good. This is good. I'll, I'll tempt David to die another way in, in, for her. And so he said in verse 21, Thou shalt this day be my son-in-law in the one of the two. All right? In other words, I've got a bride for you, David. I've given away me, rabbit. I've got another one for you. And all David had to do for her, for her hand in marriage, was to kill 100 Philistines and to bring back their foreskins to prove that he had killed 100 Philistines. And we're told in verse 25 that the reason why Saul wanted this is he thought to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. But David was pleased by this. He, he, he was more than happy to do this work. And not only did he bring back 100 foreskins, he brought back 200 foreskins of the Philistines. He brought back abundantly, exceedingly more than was necessary. He brought back 200. And so, verse 27 says that Saul gave him Michal, his daughter, to wife. And in verse 29, and Saul was yet the more afraid of David, and Saul became David's enemy continually. Now, to put this a little more simply, what happened here is Merab, her name means multiplication or increase, right? So a multiplying, an increase. And David did not marry Merab. And the picture there is that she's the majority, the increase of Saul. Right? Saul's majority, his, his increase of his people, of in, in his daughter there, she was given to another. And while it seems to us like she should have been the one given to David, she wasn't, and she was given to another in marriage. Now, the picture there is, is that, you know, we think that the, that the majority of people, right, that, that the majority of people should be the Lord's, but, but but in the world, it's not the majority that are the Lord's. It's a small number, right? And now David seems to have wanted to provoke David by doing this. He wanted to anger David. He was trying to slight David. But we don't read anywhere in there that David was offended or moved or did anything about this. He didn't seem to care at all by not having Mirab's hand. And instead, David married Michal, whose name means a little stream of water. That's what her name means, a little stream of water. And for her hand, he slew the Philistines, not the bare minimum of Philistines that he was supposed to slay, but an abundant number, exceeding and abundantly more than he had to do. And so the gospel picture in this is simple. <laughs> it's true but it's very comforting to the Lord's people. Our Lord didn't take the hand of the men. He didn't take the majority of people in this world. He passed the, the majority by. I remember when I was in college, I was asked a lot of times when I would try to talk to people about Jesus, and, and I was asked a lot of times, well, if God is true, or if Jesus is, is God and we're to believe Christ, believe on him, why do so many people not believe? Why does the majority believe this thing here? 
why doesn't the majority believe him? Right? And so to the natural man, the natural man thinks, well, the majority should be the Lord's. If he's God, then most people should believe on him. Most people should be his people. But we don't see that, do we? We don't see the majority believing on Christ. And it's just like we would think that Merab should have been given to David, but she wasn't. And it didn't bother David at all. He wasn't upset by it. He, he didn't care at all that she wasn't given to him in marriage. And so the increase was passed by. Instead, our Lord came for a people who is small in number, right? A people that is like a little stream of water. A little stream of water. She's the remnant according to the election of grace, of grace, and that, that, that is the Lord's people were given to Christ before the foundation of the world. That remnant of God was given to the Lord before the foundation of the world. And the gospel says, the elder shall serve the younger, right? The elder shall serve the younger. It's a picture of the old man of flesh that, that serves the new man. It's, it's the new man of grace that remnant of the Lord's grace that receives the blessings of God. And so for the hand of his bride, that which was chosen of by the Father, our Lord came in the flesh, and he fought all our enemies, and he went and gave his life. Right? David didn't die, but, but that's the picture there. He went there, Saul sent him there to die at the hand of the Philistines for his daughter's hand. And that's what our Lord did. He came and he gave his life. He sacrificed himself unto the Father for the salvation of his people. When he died on the cross, defeating all our foes, satisfying all our debts, reconciling us to God, and, and, and establishing us in righteousness, the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and, and not only did he just do the bare minimum, <laughs> having loved his own, it says he loved them unto the end, unto the very end. He did abundantly, exceedingly above all that we can ask or think. He did abundantly for his people in saving us. And so his righteousness is our robe of righteousness. His garments are our praise. We rejoice in him. And we, we, we trust him and commit our inheritance into his hand knowing whom we have believed, knowing that he is able to keep that which we've committed unto him. He is our sword and our bow. That is, he's all our defense, and he's the one in who, who, who is our safekeeping. He's our, our keeper. He's our protector. He's our all. He's our girdle of truth by whom we bear fruit unto God in truth, in spirit and in truth. And so we see here in this picture how a covenant has been established by God. And, and, and all our salvation is in the, the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ. And because of that covenant, Christ was persecuted. And all his people in him are persecuted by those who are outside of the covenant. The enmity of man. Because he hates the Lord's people. He wants that. He's jealous for that. He wants that glory and to rejoice in, in his own works. And so he persecutes the, the, the people of God. And he persecutes, just like Saul persecuted uh, David. But we see that he just went about and established that covenant and, and was delivered by the, the power and glory of God through all that until the time appointed when he went to the cross for the hand of his bride. To save her by, by defeating the enemy there on the cross to establish us in perfect righteousness and to marry us. And so that's the rejoicing of, of, of this chapter. And that's the, the gospel that we see there of the Lord Jesus Christ traced out for us in David and in and, and, and all that persecution and hatred of Saul. So you that believe, you're that little stream of water, that remnant of the Lord's people, one for whom Christ came. So I pray the Lord bless that word to your hearts forever.